Hello, I'm Bishop Robert G. Brown, and I want to welcome you to Talk Time. It is so good to have you as part of our audience today, and we hope that uh, what you hear will be inspiring, for we believe we have a great show for you today. Uh, on this day, we have with us a, uh, an, an, an educator, a, uh, oh, he's just a lot of things. He's an author. He has just uh, written and has come out with uh, his new book, Solomon's Plan, The Gift of Education. Uh, from a father to his son. His name is Ron Walker, and we're so happy to have him with us in the studio today. Good morning, Ron, and welcome to Talk Time. Good morning, Bishop. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you accepted it. Uh, I have uh, read uh, Solomon's Plan, and uh, it's and I want you to know it's not a long reading, so once you get into it, you can't put it down, and you when you do put it down, you'll start thinking for yourself, wow, I have a lot to do. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Solomon's plan, and we're also going to talk about uh, some of the things to an educational collaborative that Ron uh, does daily, an organization that he created several years ago. But it's basically helping young men, and in particular young black men, uh, to find themselves and to know that education is one of the keys uh, to getting up from under. And so, Ron, I'd like for you to just turn around and talk about Philadelphia, because you're from Philadelphia, right? I'm a native of Philadelphia, born, bred, raised in Philly, and, uh, you know, born in a community that was all black. Uh, my teachers were all black, uh, save a few uh -huh, white uh -huh. teachers. Um, but it was a community that, uh, as we say, the village was raising me. Yeah. In addition to my mother and my father, I had Victor Ken, you know, Miss Mary across the street, Mr. Johnny across the street. And uh, played sports and you know street ball and you know little league ball, so that that root system in Philly is what really what nurtured and brought me up. Well, that's that's great. And Solomon's Pond comes from that uh, experience in Philadelphia as you were a child. Um, so why don't we just get into the book a little sure. bit because we're going to talk about Philly mm -hmm. and. And uh, your dad and mm -hmm. your mom and everybody mm -hmm. are all part of that. So why don't you take us through uh, Solomon's Plan a little bit? Sure. Uh, well, Solomon's Plan is a book about, uh, let me get right to the heart of it, about a father who was uneducated, couldn't read, couldn't write. Um, as I like to say, while he was illiterate, he was not ignorant. You know, uh, he came from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And through the great black migration, yeah. he and my mother made a route to up north. My mother's from Alabama, but my father left after his parents died and came from South Carolina to Philadelphia to make his way. He had a cousin who lived in Philadelphia. And so at an early age, about 17, 18, he was in Philadelphia with just that one relative and was able to find his way largely because of a personality that was as large as this room. Yeah. It was personable. Um, so he, he ended up getting into the construction industry. Okay. And um, at a time when black men, at a time when black men were the primary laborers. Right. Right. You know, you won't see that necessarily today. Yeah. But that was the case, and so he rose to the labor ranks to become a labor foreman. Now think about it. There's a man who couldn't read or write, but because of his way with people and his personality, he was a labor foreman. Had a crew of about ten to fifteen men. Mm -hmm. Now, what was interesting about my father, and as I, you know, start to really follow him, growing up, coming home from work every day, he would bring home a little book about about this size, yeah. right? And it was a, his time book. Now, he couldn't read or write, but he had a memory. He said he would memorize who he hired that day, who he gave overtime to, who he had to lay off, come home. Give me this book from a pencil and said, now son, here are the names of these men. Write them down. Here's the hours they worked. Here's what they did. And I, I just thought that was amazing. I said, how could you work all day and have all these things in your mind, you know, and come back home after a long, hard day and, you know, and, rec and record it. So it was that kind of memory. He found a way to organize himself. He found a way to organize Discipline. himself. Right. Yeah. In order to survive and make it. Right. I'm sure that he could succeed in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's uh, fascinating. In, in those days, uh, and, and we're old enough, we're the product of uh, that parent who did not have a lot of education, if any education at all. That's right. But there were times that you never realized that. Uh, they, they appeared to have known so much. I could remember my own father uh, 
uh, who I really thought was wealthy and was nowhere near mm. wealthy, but he, he always looked like he had a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> mine too. Yeah. Well, mine too. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, he would come home, you know, with cement or, you know, smelling the hard work, eat dinner. And I have to, t have to reveal to the audience that when he um, finished dinner, <clears throat> shortly thereafter, I'd take his bath. Then he would dress to the nines, you know, put a suit on, tie. And you know, when I was young, I said, well, you know, he worked all day. Then he came up and eat. Then he put clothes on. And, and went. Now, what he was doing um, at that time before the lottery, he was a number writer. Oh, okay. So my father was a number writer. Um, and he would, and this was his way of making ends meet. You know, so he would go out from 7 until 12 writing numbers. Now, of course, we knew that was illegal, but, you know, at that time, black people were doing other things to yeah, cobble yeah. together an income. Yeah, yeah, everybody had a little hustle. They had a little hustle, you know. <laughs> and then at the same time, he was, and I just think about the scope. He not only was a construction worker by day, wrote numbers at night, and on Sunday, he was at church every Sunday because he was a trustee. He okay. was counting money. Now, you, you know, so... T taking them outside skills and bringing them in. <laughs> outside skills and bringing them in, bringing them in and being very dutiful. Yeah. And would remind me that you can't do anything without prayer in your life right. every day. Right. So he was kind of a, a renaissance man back in the time when, you know, you didn't, you know, he had multifaceted approach to life. So he did a lot of things uh, in, in, in your early years to, to help give you a firm, uh, uh, grounded foundation. Um, how do how do you attribute to the fact that uh, you you've gone so far ac academically? Let's mm -hmm. let's sort of stick back with uh, uh, the understanding that you, your parents gave you, and mm -hmm. because that's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. Well, it was two phases to that. It uh, must weave in my mother too. Mm -hmm. By the way, I have a book sure. coming out about her that I'd like to talk about too. Oh, all right. Yeah, but um, so my parents, both of them coming from that segregated South, mm -hmm. from sort of the Jim Crow conditions, making their way through the Great Migration, knew that there was going to be a better way that they will do all they can to make a better life for their children, you know, for my sister and I and my younger brother. And so one day when he asked me, uh, son, do you want to go to college? I was about 15 years old, Bishop. And I said, yes, sir, I would love to go to college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, because we don't have the kind of money takes to send you straight out, you'll have to come here with me on a construction job. And because of his relationships, you know, I want underscore, I think that's one of the things I got from him, and it's power to convince other folks that my son will be responsible. So he introduced me to a carpenter, a white carpenter, mm. my name was Ducky. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to a, a cement mason, a black man he called Rev. Okay. And he said, I'd like to put my son with you, and you know, as your assistant. That'd be okay. So the transaction was one personal relationship. They said, yeah, we got him. Okay, fine. So the ages 15, from the time I graduated from college, every summer I was in a construction job. Uh, high rises. I mean, big, multi-level buildings working construction. And you got to remember, it was a child against the child labor laws. But mm -hmm. because of the relationship, they would let me work. Let you, yeah. yeah, pick up some lumber. You know, I was under their watch until I got... To the age of 18, 19, right. where I could work on my own in yeah. the union. And so every summer I did that. Now, I have to admit to you, uh, I didn't like one bit of it. <laughs> and, you know, I was stepping on nails, my boys were playing basketball, you know, and, you know, going to parties and all the things. I said, Man, I'm missing all this. But the black part is, I made a salary. At that time, I was making $200 a week. Now, back in the uh, late 50s, the early 60s, Two hundred dollars a week for a, a young black a boy Man. was huge money. <laughs> now I gotta tell you this. Now, don't think that my father let me put that two hundred dollars in my pocket. Yeah. Okay. So at every payday, which was every Friday, he said, "Okay, we're making the first stop." I said, "Where's that there? To the bank. You put half of it in the bank." I said, half of it. Half of the two hundred. <laughs> yeah. And then the next stop. Is at home, you give your mother the half of the hundred you got left. So he made sure that I was of saving money and being responsible for part of the needs of the home. And he said, after all, you got $50 in your pocket. That's more than your boys got. 
which is true, you know. So I had this sort of mindset about the work ethic, about saving, and at the same time, um, at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, when I finished, you know, college graduation and so forth, I realized the plan he had. Okay. And the plan basically was, um, I said, Dad, I may be uh, slow, but I'm not stupid. I got your plan. Yeah. yeah. I didn't want to be on that construction job. Yeah. And the men there were, were encouraging me, be all you can be. You know, you don't want to be out here. And after stepping on four or five nails, 16 penny nails, I knew I didn't want to be there. Right. Because that was part of his plan right. to see what I could be and what I didn't have to do. You know, it's, it, it's amazing because the more we listen to these uh, stories, especially from uh, individuals who are around our age and, and had a, a father at home, mm -hmm. uh, there was a certain operation that just took place in, in, in the household that not only uh, were our mothers uh, in, involved in our lives, but our dads as well. And we learned those type of lessons because, you know, my father had a, a work ethic that uh, I, I think I mirror today mm -hmm. uh, only because I saw he, he worked about uh, two, three jobs, mm -hmm. uh, making ends meet, uh, uh, got himself out of the projects, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he bought his first house, bought his second house and everything, and, and still with a lack of... Uh, uh, education was able to find the ways and means to do it, but didn't just keep it to himself. Right. Sort right. of shared it, That's shared right. it with myself, my brother, my sisters. Right. And so it, it, it's always good to hear these type of stories. So your dad basically was your first educator. My dad was my first educator. He was also my first male role model. Okay. You know what I mean? Being yeah. a black man, and today, you know, we're looking for more black men to mentor and model roles, positive roles for young black men, mm -hmm. my dad was that first role model. Not only the importance of education that he underscored, he didn't have it, but you're going to get it. Yeah. The work ethic, mm -hmm. you know, being responsible, and also how I carried myself, you know, in the world, you know, how I look, how I, you know, dress, and um, how I handle myself, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that was both by carousy, consciously, consciously from my father. Yeah. You know, like, like you said, both my parents played that role in different ways, but that was, that was his plan. Now, I know the book talks about a father's uh, uh, gift to his son. Right. But we, we can't leave mom out. No, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> please don't do that. My mother's name is Dolores Walker. And um, the, the, the real educational component, knowing that my father didn't have, my mother had a high school education. Mm -hmm. She came from uh, Wetumpka, Alabama. Wetumpka, uh, uh, Alabama. It's 25 miles from um, Montgomery. Okay. Which I recently had a chance to just stand on that ground for the first time. Yeah. And she made her way to Philadelphia to work in West Virginia first. My grandfather followed the job and worked in the steel and coal mill. Mm -hmm. And then from the coal mines and then from there to Philadelphia. So she was a high school graduate who was exceptional. She was an oratorical champion. Um, she won a contest and had a book autographed by Langston Hughes. Oh, mm -hmm. all, right, all right. She actually won a scholarship, a partial scholarship, to go to West Virginia State College. Yeah, yeah. But somehow, she was a she was a, a part of a family of six other siblings. So my grandfather couldn't afford to pay for the rest of. This is the story my mother told me, and so he said, "If I can't send them all, I can't send you." Now I always said, "Why did he do that?" Why didn't he see the wisdom of, you know, letting my mother go to college and, and have her to share and pull back the others? But it didn't happen that way. So she was someone who was denied that further opportunity, but she was thirsty for education of all kinds. She was a Sunday school teacher, um, superintendent of Sunday, of Sunday school, um, very, very faith-based and driven. Um, Love schools came to school probably me more than I did in terms of coming coming up. They knew her on a regular basis. Right, right. And so this next book is going to be called Dolores's Dream, mm -hmm. and how her dream of being educated, of being an educator, didn't happen, but she certainly channeled it into me. Yeah, but for sure. You know, um, one of the reasons that I asked you to uh, uh, come on the uh, show today is uh, obviously about the book and how I was impressed. Uh, with how your life uh, grew into being what it is today mm -hmm. and how you are sharing 
uh, those same lessons in, in you know in a more modern way than that you received when you were young that the, uh, the, the you caught the fire you, yeah. you, you just caught the essence of what your your parents mm -hmm. were uh, uh, trying to instill with you and it's important uh, in this particular day and age that we we constantly remind young people in particular uh, that it is necessary it's imperative uh, that they uh, get an education, get the best education possible. Now, uh, we also have to be mindful that uh, everybody's not uh, geared for uh, for college right. or anything, but we need to, if not college, we need to learn a trade. We need to learn how to do something to propel us uh, beyond uh, just hanging out in the street. Mm -hmm. And so when you wound up in your uh, high school years, uh, going into college, right. give us some feedback on how that was beginning to take shape. Sure, sure. You know, and uh, again, part of my story was in high school, I was an average student. I wasn't a terrible student, but, you know, I was an average student. But I, did, but I knew even in that that education was important because that was instilled in me in the household. And so little stories that, that I'll share. Uh, when I was a senior in high school in Philly, John Bartram High School in Philadelphia, our counselor, who was a black man, Mr. Murray, mm. called all of us to the office one by one to talk about next steps and future steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can sometimes remember people vividly by some of the things they say. Right. And he said, Mr. Walker or Ronald uh, called me, I don't know whether you're college, you're crazy, I don't know what your college material <laughs> You know, so me and my, you know, I was kind of like, hmm, okay, well, let me go home and let my mother know that this man is saying I don't necessarily need to go to college. So I went home and said, Mom, Mr. Murray said that you know, he didn't think I was college material. And, my, and again, I remember to this day, my mother said, well, I know Mr. Murray must be crazy. I didn't think he was. Oh. And so the next morning, she said, we're going to get up and I'm going to school with you on the bus. To I'm taking public transportation. Right, now right. imagine, I'm 17, a senior, and get all my boys on the bus, and my mother's sitting next to me, right? <laughs> She's going to high school to meet and see yeah. Mr. Murray. Yeah, we're, we're going to have a conversation. Oh, we're going to have a conversation <laughs> about this. <laughs> and when she met him, knocked on the door, Mr. Murray, and she was always professional in her demeanor and always, you know, carried herself well, dressed well. I said, Mr. Murray, my, I'll have you know my son is going to college, and uh, I will accept no uh, undervaluing or something to that effect. Because of that advocacy, I applied to one college. I mean, I was that behind. I applied to one college because of her advocacy, saying that there is no negotiation in this matter. Mm -hmm. And that was Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, um, HBCU. Yep. And, you know, those who might know Lincoln, Langston Hughes, and Thurgood Marshall, right. and a couple of African presidents. Right. And that was a pivotal change in my life. In fact, that she had advocated for me. And then I made that step, and that was a step to really put the door open you know, to, my, to my life. How was life at, at, at Lincoln once you got there? Oh, man, life at Lincoln was, was great. I mean, I was, uh, you know, when you go there as a freshman, you get sort of a narrative because all of a sudden I got freedom, you know. Um, and what I was going in, and then you start to realize that I'm here for a purpose too. I mean, I can't fail yeah. because too much. I'm holding up the family now, so I can't fail. So um, I made it to the freshman year, which is usually a lot of times that kids struggle right. when they drop out. I joined a fraternity, uh, so I was in fraternity life, and uh, you know it was right during the period of the '60s. So I had two professors. Between 64 when I went in and 1960 when I graduated, that changed my life. And I think they also added to my, my movement towards education. One of them was, at the time, the most uh, well-known author, Frederick Douglass, an educator Frederick Douglass, it was a white man by the name of Philip Foner, okay. F-O-N-E-R. Uh -huh. And he wrote the uh, iconic uh, autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And if, for those who may not know about Frederick Douglass, one of the major lessons I learned is one reason I read Where Does Hat. Uh, Frederick Douglass was, was a slave, as you know. And one day, the master's wife, the master's name was Thomas Auld, A U L D, mm. and came upon his wife 
teaching Frederick Dukes how to read. And you know, know at that time, teaching a slave how to read was a no-no. Right, absolutely. Frederick Douglass was probably nine or ten years old. Yeah. He was young. Yeah. And so what happened is um, he said to his wife, what are you doing? And she said, I'm teaching Frederick how to read. And basically he said, if you, you want to ruin a slave, to let him learn how to read. It would be no more good to us. Um, and so he began to give Frederick Douglass a weapon. And so Frederick Douglass, in his own wisdom, said, if this man is going to whip me for reading, mm -hmm. I'm going to read. Okay. And he became self-taught and learned how to read. Yeah. And so that professor sort of opened that door to me about what, what can be done despite the odds. And the other was Professor uh, James Farmer, who was iconic civil rights leader. He led the organization called the Congress of Racial Equality Corps. And he, he rode in the same, or walked in the same steps as uh, Martin Luther King, and Whitney Young. Uh, he was part of that. Uh, Roy Wilkins. And so he said, I just got back from Mississippi, you young Lincoln men. And I think you all need to think about doing something for others. And so that led me and eight of my fraternity brothers to go to Mississippi in 1966. At the time when you were a black boy, Young man going to Mississippi. Now remember, it was two years after the civil rights workers were killed. Right, absolutely. And, and where we went, <clears throat> Belzoni, Mississippi, uh, was also called Bloody Belzoni because mm -hmm. of all the activism and bombings and stuff. So I went there at the age of 1920 and uh, saw poverty and miseducation and lack of education up close and personal. That also was seared in my mind. So not only did I have sort of that context of my parents. Now remember too, the other thing that I had failed to mention, that when I was nine years old, I saw the picture of Emmett Till, mm -hmm. right, who mm -hmm. was murdered in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I asked my mother, what happened to that black boy? And she told me uh, what happened to him. And I said, I'm never going to Mississippi. Ten years later, I was in Mississippi. Now, I got to say, that's not been God's plan. Because I had no intentions at, at the seeing that face. They go to Mississippi. Yeah. Ten years later, I'm on the Delta in Mississippi, um, giving out food to the hungry, and also begin, I think, begin be, being prepared for what my next steps are going to be. Right. So, 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 being then having had made a statement, <coughs> which which I, I I did myself. There were a few southern states that I was never going to go to right. that I wound up in right. eventually in my life, right. and Mississippi was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've been there a few times mm -hmm. now. Um, what, what do you believe was happening with you, uh, at that time to begin to formulate what you would eventually become? Yes. Well, I think, um, something was emerging, something was starting to shape and start to order my steps. I didn't really call it that because I didn't really wasn't that, you know, that deeply, you know, familiar with some of the things that, you know, go with really deeply embedded faith. Uh, I went to church on Sunday. Sunday school, but you know, this was something happening. I'm starting, you know, being in certain places, meeting certain people. Um, and so I started to realize that uh, there was something that I had that um, I couldn't deny. And that was a gift for both sharing with other folk, particularly with young people, uh, teaching. You know, mm -hmm. I was a, a junior teacher, Sunday school, and, and you know, I liked engaging when I was. You know, he used to call me when I was uh, a little boy because I used to take the whole little school on the sidewalk, me and Mr. Walker, you know, because I always wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't know I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. You know, I mean, I didn't say, but it, it probably was part of genes, part of, you know, the calling that I started to see my direction. And the other thing I think shaped during the Vietnam War, which was during the era where I was, you know, yeah. growing up in, as yeah, you know. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, when they had the draft numbers, yeah. I sat in front of the TV because at that time they would call your number yeah, out. Right. You see, well, you want to go or not go. That's right. And I had a high draft number, 224, I remember it. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that I wasn't going to Vietnam or to the military, but I decided to go into a special program that was called the Intern Teaching Program for College Graduates. Mm -hmm. It was a program that was designed to help me get my teaching credentials helped me get my master's, and I was at Temple University in Pennsylvania. Okay. And so, again, the steps were sort of moving in that direction. From Lincoln to Temple. From Lincoln to Temple University, right? And went and got my, uh, my, my teaching credentials. 
I then taught school at the same school I attended as a, as a young junior high school student. I went back, you know, and uh, teachers, some teachers remembered me, and I taught there for almost nine, ten years. I had a very successful experience working with learners that other people felt were the slowest of the slow. That's so let, to me. let me stop you right here mm -hmm. for a second because <clears throat> you've got from uh, Lincoln to, to Temple, uh, all of a sudden, education is beginning to, to, to shape and, and, really and, and mold you uh, into what you're, you're presently doing. But I, I do want you to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, 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 that, that teaching error, that, uh, especially in the beginning. Right. And within it, what, what was helping you to see? The need for, for in particular, uh, as, as we go along, uh, dealing with, with with black young men. Sure, sure. Well, a couple of things, and there, there was a couple of students that really sort of illuminated that for black young men, and I'll talk about that. But one of the other things, I was a lover of history. I mm -hmm. loved history, mm -hmm. and I love things that I read a book. Um, for the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. And so I was a lover and appreciated history about black people. Now, I was introduced to it by my mother because of you know, Langston Hughes, she loved black poets and the Harlem Renaissance. So she was always quoting things and one of the poems she always used to quote, seemed like on a nightly basis to me, was from Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Talked about resilience and yeah, perseverance right. and never turning back right. and in the face. And she was preparing me for a world that was not going to necessarily be appreciative of a black male. And yeah. I didn't know it, but yeah. she was preparing me for that. So I loved history and I loved, you know, getting, uh, getting young people, particularly, uh, I had all black students, in touch with who they were, that whole identity component of being proud. But then I had two particular and special young men that came that were in my life when I was teaching at Sayre Junior High School in Philadelphia back in the 70s. One was named Wendell Holiday. And Wendell was uh, sharp as a tack intellectually mm -hmm. and uh, you know good personality, the jokester. And then one day he said, Mr. Walker, um, I'm moving. The family's moving. I'm leaving West Philadelphia to go to North Philadelphia. And uh, I'm, you know, Basically, he was there to leave the class. So I said, Wendell, just keep doing the right thing. You're going to be fine. Yeah. And he said, thank you. Two weeks later, Wendell was, was killed in a gang fight. Wow. And that was the first time I lost a student. Yeah. And, you know, and I went to his funeral, and uh, I'm saying, just two weeks ago, you were in my classroom. And it, he, he was um, stabbed in a gang fight. Um, and I don't know whether he was recruited because he wasn't a gang boy when he left my classroom. So he might have been recruited because of the area where he was moving to. And I said something, you know, what's going on here? And then the other student, equally as bright, personable, good looking kid, by the name of Kevin Johnson. And Kevin was, again, um, you know, my opinion could have done anything. So. As I was beginning to wind my time down in Philly and begin to make a preparation, make this transition to Massachusetts, mm -hmm. I said to Kevin, this is 1978, I remember, you also can do well in life, you know, continue and follow your, your dreams, but, you know, stay on the right road. And he said, Mr. Walker, I got this, don't worry about me. You know, so I was 14, confident. So, years go by. That was 1978. By 1986, I was a principal in Cambridge, Massachusetts. One day I got a letter in the mail. I opened the letter up and it, it was the markings of somebody with a penitentiary. Mm -hmm. So I opened it up and I said, you know, who do I know? My brother was in jail. You know, my brother, my sister, who mm -hmm. is this? And I read the letter and said, Mr. Walker, you may not remember me. This is Kevin Johnson, your former student. And I'm incarcerated for life without parole for a murder that I did not commit. And you may not believe me, but I've been taking courses, working, you know, on my GED. At that time, he was 23. Yeah. Working on my GED, and I'm working in the prison school as an inmate assistant. 
And uh, we started writing each other from that time, starting in 1986 to this very day. Now, in 2006, I get a phone call from the principal of the penitentiary school where he's working. Mm -hmm. And he, she said, uh, my name is Patty Raymer. Inmate Kevin Johnson has been stellar, responsible, and he always talks about his former teacher. And so he's convinced me to invite you to give the keynote message to 200 inmates who are getting their GEDs and some giving college credits. That was, again, this, this you know, sort of this, sort of this uh, journey I was on, didn't know it. And so um, I went there. Um, by that time, I had left the principalship, and I was doing some other school-related work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. education-related work. But to but to do that, um, and I went to see him, and at the time when I saw him, I remember, last time I saw him, when I left Philly, he was 14. Yeah. When I reconnected with Kevin in prison, he was in his mid-40s, okay? And I followed... And after we, we commiserated and, you know, we laughed, we joked, we shed tears, we broke bread, we talked about experiences, I went to the, to the stage and I followed an inmate who was the, the valedictorian, so to speak. And what he said actually was the, was the final tipping point for me to go into this new line of work. He said, although I'm a felon, I may not see the light of day, I'm free because I'm educated. And that's, you know, my goodness, just, you know, he's in the in a hard place that he's saying this. And so um, the good news about Kevin is that we've been writing up to this day. I received a letter from him about uh, about a month ago saying the Innocence Project had taken this case, but what happened, to, which was more consequential, the person who accused him of the murder, and I saw the letter that the, the lawyers got sent me a copy, recanted her story. She said, I was a crack addict. I knew where this drug dealer's drugs was, yeah. and I needed it, and I accused or fingered Kevin Johnson. So he's likely to get out soon. Um, he's now 60 years old. So wow. Been, so that's the, the chronology. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, and to for him to have reached out in the way that he did, uh, and for you guys, uh, not only for him to reach out, but for you to respond. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, very important. Look at uh, how many times people do reach out and nobody does nobody, respond. And, nobody and so it, it's it, it's important if we're about if we're going to make any any changes, we have to re respond to the circumstances and situations that that are before us. Which which sort of brings me to uh, modern uh, uh, day times, which uh, you brought us up to two thousand and six. Mm -hmm. uh, after. Um, uh, having a coming together with uh, uh, Kevin and, and, and maintaining a, a long lasting uh, uh, relationship while he is uh, still in, in, incarcerated, I, I'm sure it helped you to rethink your position and, and, and what you really need to do yeah. as an educator specifically to help young men. It did. And what was that? It did. I mean, it, it really, after that speech, I was um, approached by some of the other inmates mm. who said um, I could have been somebody. I wish I had taken that opportunity. If only I had had that teacher. If only I had a community. I mean, just the, the whole gamut of reasons that these young these men and most of the young men were saying that um, I had that hope. Yeah. You know. And for me, uh, something clicked inside, and I said. I have seen these young men, many of whom may have done something, you know, um, but many of them who may have been something yeah. or somebody. Right. That they had that teacher, right. that, that surrounding community, the network of support. And I said, to that end, I gotta do something. Yeah. And so that's when I, you know, I was in Pennsylvania, upstate Pennsylvania, with all these prisons upstate. I called Tony. I said, Tony, I'm. A, I'm and Tony's your wife. Tony's my wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got to start something. I got to do something. You know, I don't know what it is, but I, 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 you know, I feel compelled to do something because I've been touched by what I've been hearing, what I've been seeing, and that was really the click point. 
mm-hmm. for me to start the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the year 2006 is when I made a prison visit. So shortly thereafter, 2007, I was starting to start a new way of life. And I had no funding. Um, I was letting go of a, of a job, you know, that I was I worked for 15 years. Was stepping out on faith. Stepping out on faith. <laughs> stepping out on faith for sure. <laughs> and, you know, and so. Big change economically. Big change economically, <laughs> you know. But see, as you know, Bishop, uh, Lord, when he got the plan for you, he sends the angels. Yeah. So he, you know, sent one angel who was, um, a woman by the name of Rosa Smith, who was, who was working and uh, led an organization foundation called the Shop Foundation, and at that time she had an interest in the education of black black boys, black um, boys and young men, mm-hmm. and so someone connected to her. Her office was in Cambridge. I went knocked on her door. She didn't know me from a can of paint. I said I got this vision that I want to start something. You know, I'm working in the space. He said. Well, young man, I'm going to give you $10,000 and what I want you to do with it. See if you can find somebody who will let you do some workshops on educating black boys. Okay. And so I said, wow, $10,000? <laughs> so, S- sound like a million. Sound like a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> sound like a million dollars. So my next step was to go to Wheelock College of the president called Jackie Jenkins Scott, another black woman, you know, who used to run the Democrat uh, Community Center in uh, Roxbury. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so she ran a college. Wheelock, Wheelock College, for those who may not know, is located in Massachusetts, and it was primarily a teaching college for teaching, preparing young people to be teachers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most of the young people then at the time were white women. Okay. And so Jackie, who's a black woman, said, she this is the power of black women in my life too, you know. She said, uh, I want you to do, because I went there, no, I didn't know what I was going to ask for. She said, I said, I got $10,000. And she said, I want you to do a series of workshops. See if you can find the best presenters who can talk about the education of black boys because I need these future teachers to understand how to relate and teach them the culture. You know, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. And man, I reached out and I got the best of the best. I got people who are not, not, you know, well known in the field of education long known for teaching culturally responsive courses mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we did that for two years and it was always a full house and that launched the organization and then from there um, I went to New York City as a foundation that George Soros had founded called the Open Society Foundation mm-hmm. and there I met uh, a young black man who was a program officer named Sean Dove and I said Sean I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to start something. So he said, I'm going to give you $75,000 a year. And here again, I'm going to, you know, but that in 2007, eight, pretty good money. Uh, and then he didn't boost it up to $300,000 a year. Wow. So, mm-hmm. so that was really the catalyst. And then the Kellogg Foundation gave us some funding. Okay. We got a big contract in Philadelphia to work with black males in seven high schools. Mm hmm. I want to write a passage identity forming uh, program, which is part of the, what black black males males need these days. So you can see it was starting, you know, the angels started to come. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I was starting to be able to pay my rent, pay my mortgage rather, and uh, keep my wife happy. But he said, "You can do this work, but you got to pay these bills." <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah, they don't go away, do no. they? No. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but you know, it, it, you know, I, I think what's really interesting here is is the actuality of stepping out on faith, having this vision, but believing enough in yourself that that this is what I'm called to do. You saw something and decided somebody needed to take action. Somebody yeah. needed to do something to help bring a curve in here. Mm-hmm in a direction of positivity rather than all of the negative things. Because if we uh, listen to uh, the news or we read newspapers, Mm -hmm. we find out that a lot of our young uh, black men are are being incarcerated. Uh, Listen, this whole issue with racial profiling, it's, it's just difficult in this 
day and age to be a black black male and and uh, if nobody's paying attention it's it, it's only going to get worse and so we we need organizations such as the one uh, that you have uh, developed uh, we need many more of them not only for black males but uh, 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 black 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 uh, uh, young women who find oh, yeah. themselves in, in crises in, in, in different ways oh, yeah. also. And so, I mean, the struggle continues. Yes. It's, it, it's never open, but uh, I'm happy we're talking about this because it brings about uh, an awareness that, uh, listen, uh, just don't talk about it. That's right. That's right. Uh, let's That's right. begin the process of, of putting that curve in there that, that, that puts us on a, the road to success. That's right. And all of these lessons that you have learned uh, uh, way back in, in, in Solomon's plan, uh, mm -hmm. back in uh, your young days in mm -hmm. Philadelphia that mm -hmm. brought you all the way up to Massachusetts. And not only the Mass, but you traveled throughout the, the country, don't you? Man? I traveled throughout the country. I just got back from Seattle mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago when we were doing our national next national conference. Um, I'm all over, I'm all, in, I'm all in the South and, you know, Chicago, New York, you know, every place where there's black boys. Yeah. You know? And you see, what most people don't realize, say, Bishop, if I were to ask you this question, you know, for the audience as well, at what grade or age level uh, do you think the most black boys are suspended from school? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Seventh? Mm -hmm. but you think, most people would say middle school is actually... Preschool. Preschool? Preschool. The research says, and there's research at a university, the brother by the name of uh, Reginald Gilliam, mm. uh, that more preschool black boys, they're expelled from school. Now, if you're expelled from school as a black boy, and you use around the age of four, what's in your mindset? That something's wrong with me. You know, and see, those who follow school and no school, so those records and Things like that follow a four-year-old to the fifth grade. So the kindergarten teacher has heard about this kid, little Brown, little, little, little Robert Brown, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So all eyes on him. And then it follows up. And so it this lays the path for the school to prison pipeline, is what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And see what goes on early unless we intervene by strong mentoring, um, teaching that liberates not school. So the reason why I'm wearing this hat is because there's a difference between being schooled as a black boy and being educated. Yeah. And the difference is schooling is for compliance. Right. Let me school you just to be rote uh, regurgitation. Yeah. Education, like Frederick Douglass said, is for liberation. Yeah. Once you get educated, you're liberated. You don't act the same way. You don't do the same things the same way. You ask questions that right. people aren't used to you asking. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to inoculate our black boys. And as you said, black girls too, because there is a crisis as well. And so it's up to us to really, in the village, in my, you know, one of my colleagues, Susan Taylor, used to be Essence Magazine, to say, says quite often, the village is on fire. But we are the fire men and women who put it out if we want to. That's the mission. So true. Again, going back into our early days, thinking about that village, I think you talk about a uh, young Robert Brown probably being uh, expended. Yeah, I, you were exp yeah, I'm yeah, sure, <laughs> sure he had been a few times. Um, uh, having always been on the street now, but but thank thank God we had that village connection. Uh, I remember when my father. Uh, bought his second house in, in Dorchester. We bought it in a, uh, a Jewish uh, neighborhood, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that just wasn't uh, something that happened every day. Like, there was only one other black family on our, our street when he, when he purchased it, and I'll never forget, you know, all the stares and the looks, and I mean, this was a, a, a cultural uh, mm -hmm. shot coming out of the Berry up into mm -hmm. uh, North Dorchester right. at the time, which was predominantly uh, Jewish mm -hmm. going into mm -hmm. Mattapan or even into Milton and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, it, it happened. Uh, what he kept trying to do uh, for himself and for his family was to to grow us into understanding that there's something out there better. And at that, in those days, uh, 
uh, that was better not to lose identity, but to understand that in spite of what other people were saying, That's right. you know, right. you can't make it. You can't make it. And, you know, and one, of the, one of the comments, because my story is similar. My parents moved from an all-black neighborhood to, to a or the house in a neighborhood that was predominantly Jewish. Yeah. So, but one of the other things I noticed about that, and remember, that a lot of my, a lot of my Jewish brethren, friends that I grew up with, certain days they went to school after school. And I said, where are you going? He said, we're going to learn about our culture. Yeah. Yeah. See, because that whole point of learning about who you are yeah. and whose you are is in a strictly people tied. So they got that. And a lot of us just went on about our business, and so we have to know who we are as well as who's we are. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, and I think we, we're losing some of that. Uh, 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 Jews in particular uh, still maintain mm -hmm. the understanding that you need to, to know about your, your, your heritage and so that you can uh, identify you know, with, with who you are, obviously. Right. Uh, I, I still believe that we, we need to do that within our own community. Back in our day, it, it was current. It, it was something that took place, uh, uh, the family reunions. Mm -hmm. uh, before you even got there, you knew who Aunt Janie, Uncle That's John right. were, and, right. and, and, and all of that. Uh, I, I think it would be beneficial uh, for us uh, uh, to be able to identify so that we can uh, I guess find a way to have a oneness right. one with the other in, in this 21st century that we're in, that uh, this black unity, this black uh, pride that, uh, it, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with being black and yet folk will have you believe That's right. that uh, you're in a pickle because you're a black That's man right. or woman. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's a lot of things that... Uh, uh, I believe that uh, we can do, but I'm also grateful for the fact that you uh, have been constant. You are like dealing with, um, you know, on, on a regular basis, this issue of helping our, our, our black uh, men and also black women. And we want to congratulate you. Listen, our time is uh, come is coming to an end, and we have been uh, talking with Ron uh, Walker, who. Uh, again, has written this great book, uh, Solomon's Plan. It's about his uh, uh, life's history between he and his father and his father uh, passing on a mantle to him of which he is is doing right now. If you want to get the book, Ron, we can, we can sure. get the book right now. If you want to get a copy of Solomon's Plan, which I hope you do, um, just you can go to the web and go to the American Reading Company. American that's, Reading That's who publishes it, the American Reading Company. If you want to find out more about our organization, the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color, you can go to the web, www.cosebock, that's spelled C-O-S-E-B-O-C dot -E org, and you'll get all the information about the organization as well. Well, Ron, I have enjoyed talking with you. This time just flew by. We could talk a lot more. Yes, but again, uh, I want to uh, thank you and uh, just uh, send our blessings to you that uh, your work will continue as long as uh, yeah. you have the energy and the fire to yeah. continue on. And, and uh, yeah, you're on a mission and you're, you're making a difference. So again... This is uh, Ron Walker. I'm Bishop Robert G. Brown, and we thank you for joining us to today. Catch us again next week for Talk Time with Bishop Robert G. Brown. God bless you. Have a great day.